There we go. Cool. This is the Rex monthly call for August of 2020. It is Wednesday, August 12th. Yesterday, Kamala Harris was uh, chosen by Joe Biden as her as his running mate for the 2020 election. It just filled the news. It was and maybe my favorite, several favorite parts of it. <coughs> One was, I am just so looking forward to the debate with Pence. Oh yeah, <laughs> he is. Uh, and the problem here is that the expectations are so high, right? And the thing Trump successfully did was he deflated expectations before every debate and then he basically gamed every debate. Um, so I'm worried that everybody's gonna be like, oh yeah, she's, she's gonna kick it, Pence's ass and then all Pence has to do is survive and he's, you know, he'll, he'll fare okay. But still, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be like mass market entertainment. Um, and then if you've, any of you have been watching like videos about Kamala's backstory, how she grew up and, and all of that, it's, uh, the CNN has a nice article that April just sent me this morning that has a kind of a video profile of her coming up and it's really sweet. Hey, why don't you put that in the chat, Jerry? That's I'm gonna okay. find it right now. You gotta reopen my brain. So I shut everything down. How's everybody doing? Should we do a, a little a little checking of the in? Yes, let's do. Please, that's... you want to start? Oh, me? Oh, sure. yeah. Go ahead. Come on. Oh, uh, me. So I've been really taking, uh, take, trying to do the real sort of European old school summer take it off time, you know. <laughs> I went to the coast yesterday, you know, so I've been really trying to just do nothing. <laughs> but of course, I don't really achieve that, but you know. It's a good try. And I, uh, I'm, watching, I'm watching the Republicans, you know, I keep, of course, close tabs on the economics and everything that's going down. And, you know, I'm enjoying gold going up. Um, I think we're currencies being devalued. Um, it's really weird to see the Republicans do the same thing they did in the Depression and threaten the recovery with. You know, this austerity thing, by the way, it happened like three times in the Depression. They would put money in, the economy come back up, and then they go, oh, let's balance the budget, let's not do that anymore. Boom, it goes right back in. And so far, don't make any mistake about this, the politicians in the central bank have done everything perfectly. Everything. Really? Yes, they've done an amazing job. Huh. And I'm not used to hearing that. Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. I really want everyone to understand. They've done a great job. <laughs> They've done everything right so far. Um, but if, they, if they, they choke demand off and stop throwing the money out, um, they'll just, austerity, that's how come the recovery was so slow from 08, 09. They stopped Obama from doing that. Mm -hmm. We've been really fortunate to be in an election cycle. Um, I think because that made it so that they would send the checks out. I don't know if the Republicans would have done it if it wasn't an election cycle. And I'm also beginning to wonder, and this may be a crackpot theory of mine, but if the Republicans think that Trump's gonna really lose the election, then I think their degree of cooperation with throwing money out could go down. Could go uh, down. Down, because they're like, remember, I, they don't represent the people, the regular people. <laughs> These are capitalists and you know, that money's gonna have to come back when the, the government spends all this money, that money's gonna have to come back. But doesn't modern monetary theory say the government can print as many bills as, <clears throat> as it feels like? And then if you're a capitalist, don't you want the government to just generate more money so that you can suck it out of the economy in your usual vile way? All right, so modern monetary theory is not a new thing. The government actually practiced it through World War II and into the 50s. And they also did something called monetary um, repression, which is the, the Fed had the, held the yield curve down. So treasury bills paid this very low percentage rate, but inflation was far ahead of this. In other words, there was negative yields. So the way the U.S. government got rid of the debt that they had to undertake to win World War II was they, they essentially, um, they, they, they underpaid people for bonds. Another way of saying that is they took money from the rich and gave it to the poor. Hmm. So they actually took money directly from the capitalists. They redistributed wealth and they did it for like 20 years. And that's that assuming the wealthy want, wanted to buy those bonds. Yeah, the wealthy were, were in a big problem situation. Like, where am I going to get a return on my money? Oh, treasury bills. Okay, well, treasury bills were so far under inflation that they were essentially getting paid back with dollars that were worth 30, 40% less. Huh. And that's, and in fact, this, this habit of doing this is going all the way back to Salon of Greece. This, for several thousand years, governments have done this exact same thing. 
And it's what we did in World War II. Modern monetary theory is not new at all. It's just what we did in the 1940s. And we're going to have to do it this time. Uh, we're going to raise taxes, and we're going to do that. And the Fed's already talking about this in their minutes. Oh, we're, they're already talking about yield curve control. So it's already in the official minutes. So the smart money is like knows this is going to happen. And essentially, it's also something we have to do because capitalism doesn't really work great when you have this extremes of wealth that we have right now. I mean, it's just so astonishing. It tends to lead to revolutions, yeah. Yeah, it's just, no, it doesn't work this way. So anyway, so this government, the, the kind of deficits, if you look at the curves, the kind of deficits we're spending, and the kind of money, and the, what's different about this period from 08, 09 is, when we printed all the money in 08, 09, it just went to bank balance sheets. It just plugged holes in bank balance sheets. It never got out into the real economy for people right. to spend. And that's why inflation didn't resolve, no, no, no problem. This time, the money's going directly from the Fed to the Treasury to the people, okay? And it's a good thing. Believe me, this is a good thing. Don't, don't, that is the exact right thing to do. Because in the Depression, remember, banks went bankrupt. Money just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And no money went to the people. And yeah. nothing. And so, again, let me reiterate that the central bank and the government are doing wonderful things. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing back in um, England and Great Britain way back when, like, like nobody had pounds sterling. Like, like everything was expensive. You know, a person's salary might be 30 pounds a year, 30 pounds a year. And so, uh, you know, a shilling or a pence or a farthing was worth a whole, a whole great bunch. But, but, but they were locked in a way that I don't understand historically where just nobody had money. It, it was really hard to come by money. Um, same thing happens in the British Raj in India. The Bengal famine happens because nobody in, in the Bengali area of India has money to buy rice. It's not that there's no rice. There's rice in the warehouses and the British will not release it. But nobody well, has money to buy rice, so they starve and die. So this, I, I bet that those situations were a result of it the money being tied to actual physical gold. Which, yes. And I, th that, I, th I think there were actual physical money constraints because they hadn't decided that you, you're free to print as much as you feel like. Now, regardless of what you hear from Crackpot saying, it's not a great thing to have that behind your currency because you can't create more of it in exactly these situations. Um, so so it, it's much, fiat money has the advantage of being able to do this, uh, of being able to print it and do what we're doing right now. And believe me, again, we're doing great. But there's, we're going to have to pay for it. Taxes are going to go sky high, and they should. Do you realize the effective tax rate on corporations is 10%? Mm -hmm. and, and, they, and Republicans would like to get rid of the corporate tax entirely. It's, it's just astonishing how far, how far the money classes have totally dominated since the 1980s. I mean, wow. The Reagan, the Reagan Revolution really did all this. Yeah, I mean, it was a huge shift, huge change. Okay, I'm done. As you can, you can tell what I'm thinking now. Cool. Uh, you know, um, I think I think different parts of this sees different. You know, we each have our radar and our filters and the things that we're that we're sort of tracking. So, um, thanks for the update, um, Dave. Wh wh where is your secure and disclosed location? I am hanging out in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Ooh, nice. We've been here about a month and we were thinking we would go back to California now, but we really can't come up with a good reason to go back. So I think we're just going to stay longer. I don't know. So it's uh, my mother-in-law has a beautiful cabin here and we're on this gorgeous lake and I kind of spend my afternoons, you know, down lakeside and it's pretty sweet. Wow, so, dude. No wonder. Terrible. No wonder. If I only had your chair, Bo, I think it, life would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's Leather's awesome. bad in the heat, David. It's hot. This stuff makes you sweat. So I don't know. <laughs> and and so, Dave, what sort of stuff are you up to? What do you, what's uh, what's on your mind? You know, I've been spending what few productive hours I have um, with a new David Hodgson gig. He's doing this global regeneration collab, hmm. um, and so it's you know it's uh, trying to do a social network capacity building accelerator thing um, focused of, around bioregional regeneration. Um, so it's been pretty, I'm really enjoying it. It's pretty cool. I mean, he's got about 450 people kind of on a Google list, a pretty active Slack channel. 
doing, you know, six or eight hours of Zoom meeting a week um, on various topics. You know, yesterday, there was one on a regeneration project outside Rio that some folks are trying to get funded. And so, you know, they're presenting their project and some kind of people are advising on fundraising and talking about how to tell the story, see how people do narrative and, you know, kind of an interesting mix of, of talents combined with some practices. Um, so, you know, I'm spending a lot of time scheduling Zoom meetings and, you know, putting out the weekly newsletter and things like that. But Yeah. Are you still doing Rasa or is this folded into that? Rasa's kind of gone quiescent. I mean, it's, it's kind of folded in, I'd say. I mean, Rasa, the regenerative agriculture sector accelerator, was the pro a product of the last time Hodgson did something like this, um, you know, six years ago. Um, so, but, you know, we never got much traction with it. And so this feels like it's got a little bit more traction and it's a little bit, I was never that interested in the focus on agriculture per se, because it's like regenerative culture is more fun. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And this has a little bit of a broader, <clears throat> a broader uh, swath. But. It's a huge broad tent. And have you guys found um, funders, investors, VCs who are focusing on regenerative? Is there such a thing? <clears throat> Um, there seems to be, you know, one of the conversation that keeps coming up is this notion that there's all kinds of funders who want to re invest in regeneration, but they can't find any projects. And then all these project people that are doing regenerative projects and can't find any funders. And it's kind of like, there's a gap here somewhere. So um, just put, put them all in the same room, turn off the lights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does seem around. like, it seems like Tinder may not be the only answer to this, but, um, I actually think it's a structural gap and we should explore why it's a structural gap. But, um, but anyway, that conversation is pretty regular. And, you know, we don't have a bunch of, you know, people who want to invest in this group. It's more kind of practitioner types and solo change makers and, you know, folks who have projects that are, they're trying to get off the ground, you know, it's that the normal, yeah, the cool, really interesting group, but they're, they're not the, uh, the Wall Street financiers. Um, if you can put a link or to, I, this is, I'm assuming, an open group that we could join the conversation if we wanted, or what is it? You know, it's not. It's member only, um, oh. but you're, I, I can, you know, if you yeah. guys are interested in joining, I would welcome you. Um, and, you know, so you have to get a referral from somebody to sign up, and then you get a membership, you get access to the Slack group and the Google Calendar and stuff like that. And there's okay. basically nothing in public uh, other than that. So. Interesting. Fascinating. Okay, so it's all being kept behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'd love to link up through Open Global Mind because it feels like a very simpatico kind of project. So, well, here let me. I'm going to stick the the membership form into the chat, and if you guys are at all interested in playing, cool. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we find the membership? But I'll I'll get it. I'll get it here. Cool. And Claudia's remote working or. Claudia's working for Vermont. Yeah, she's doing, yeah, she's got a whole nother story. She, I don't know, my wife is um, head of a, a group that does uh, health data integration in California. So they get data from health insurance companies and doctors and hospitals and put it all into a great big database. They've got, I think, I think some data for 20 million Californians at this point. Um, and it turns out health data is kind of an interesting topic right now. So there's all kinds of things going on. A lot of negotiations with the governor's office about, you know, who has to share what data when and what, it, where is all the corona testing data and stuff like that. Wow. So she's staying pretty busy. Wow. But yeah, doing it from Vermont. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, Susan, what's, uh, want to check in? Sure. Um, I just um, started the uh, census enumeration yesterday. And um, this is a really interesting time to be trying to do that. Um, so uh, for the first time, the US Census is on an iPhone, the data collection. Yay. Right, it's fine, except that where I live, we don't have a lot of connection. <laughs> but it works, it works pretty well. Yeah. Um, and, and I went through a um, serious amount of training um, and, uh, but what is concerning, I think, is that for instance, so now we have paper ballots, I mean, paper, <laughs> paper ballots, <laughs> paper census forms. Right. We have mailed census forms. We did ours we online through the website. Online collection. And 
this thing I get generated, I got 36 cases this morning, okay? Now, there's no way I'm gonna do 36 cases. Of those, 22 were uh, mailing addresses because they try to put you in your local environment. So I'm up here, you know, on, around Skyline Boulevard and where I live and pestering my neighbors and stuff. And, uh, but, but they're mailing addresses, right? Because I can tell because they're not, you know, the, the addresses, my mailing address is at the gate three miles away and it got five numbers in it. It's on Skyline Boulevard, right? These all have three numbers, right? And I know where most of them are. There's a big couple of big batches of mailboxes on logs, you know, up and down Skyline. So there's nobody there at the mailbox. Right. And, so and I don't know what address you, it's assigned to. They've given you the scavenger hunt version. Right. And, yeah. and that was, I can't go in there. I don't, I mean, I don't know how to find the people that are supposed to be correlated with that particular mailbox. Wow. And another interesting thing is, is so I'm wondering where all this is coming from. I mean, and most of the people I talked to yesterday were, had already claimed that they had already sent it in. Now there's a special case. So there's about seven cases for NERFU. What's NERFU? Um, not responded. Uh, so the found undocumented? They're, no. They're, no, they're oh. not. They're, they just didn't respond. But uh, uh, that's a special category of like six. There are six categories of case, right? Uh, some of them are double checks to make sure the qu quality checks. Some of them are, two of them are that. Two of them are um, um, just to verify that the address is there and there is, there is a building there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that it's livable in or not. And, uh, and there are various cases like this and some of them, um, but everybody I talked to yesterday claimed that they had not only sent in things, but had done it online too. So now we have data that I entered, data that is, was mailed in and data that was put in online. And many people have done all three. Wow. You tell me what's going to happen. It's going to be a record matching nightmare among among many other nightmares because they're busy trying to shut down the census right now right 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 well they they shut down they cut mm. off a month right so san mateo county is now hiring a thousand new enumerators this week do you know ken homer no so he's in uh marin and he was was an enumerator also uh -huh. and had like 40 people under him he was sort of a supervisor of oh the yeah area, he was supervisor so, yeah of the area and uh, he was not enjoying the process at this point because it was going crazy and they were shutting it down. I'm hypothesizing if this is a bad enough shit show that if Biden gets reelected, the first thing he should do is it, run the census again next year. Yeah. Is that even a possibility? Uh, that has, I have not heard that mentioned, no. Um, I know my supervisor mm -hmm. is also going nuts. Um, you know, we have to do things like, I. The first day I get my little case and mm -hmm. there's a, an icon of a hand of a old fashioned telephone handset there. <laughs> like, What's that? And he says, I have no idea. Nobody else seems to know either, you know, and several hours later it turns up and it says that, uh, I can't remember what it means actually right now, but, um, I, I was pretty impressed with how organized it was. I was impressed with how willing everybody is to talk that I have talked to so far. Yeah. We were warned about, we had all kinds of training on what to do about the dangerous cases. And if somebody shows up with a baseball bat at the door, just you know, thank them for their time and leave. Leave quickly. <laughs> call, <laughs> leave very quickly and call yeah. your supervisor. Um, then there were things like, oh, the, the, the interesting thing about the, there are, Incidents and accidents, right? The first third of them is car accidents of people driving around and getting in accidents because you're right, you're going places you don't really know and you're looking around trying to find, you know, an address. And uh, the second set is, um, oh no, the first, no, the first huge category, the third is, is falls. The next is car accidents. And the last is animal bites, mostly dogs. In your neighborhood, it could be emu, it could be sheep. 
It could be sheep. It could, we don't, well, we don't have sheep anymore. We, we, just, we have, we have llamas. Well, except that I'm not sure there are any llamas left because the mountain lions uh, did in the llama and a zebra. <clears throat> no. Okay. Yes. I can see the zebra. It seems like such a natural fit. Yeah. Oh, the zebras were so wonderful. Oh, mm -hmm. Love yeah. those zebras. Damn. One day I came home from work and there was a baby llama, a baby, there was a, uh, two Sicilian donkeys and a, uh, and a zebra. Baby and a zebra. partridge in a pear tree. And it, that too. All of it. Wow. Right now we have a surfeit of Sicilian donkeys. And they're rather noisy and funny and, you know. But they don't go walking anymore because the neighbors got tired of, well, the worst yeah. thing that happened was that when the camel ate the wisteria, the neighbors, Seamus McNiven's bucks of bucks fame, uh, his wife was growing with wisteria. They live in the neighborhood and she, um, anyway, she was unhappy. Wow. She said, I spent 12 years growing that wisteria and the camel came in and just ate it. Whence come it the donkeys? The donkeys have been here for a while. They're, they're huge fun. Hi, Esty. And they, um... Hi. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I had somebody from Portugal here uh, for d working on a project and, um, and, I, and he asked what that, somebody asked what that was. I said, oh, those are silly Sicilian donkeys. He says, well, are there any other kind? <laughs> These are very well, small donkeys. In case there's a big emergency and the road is wiped out, they can help you get everything off the hillside. That's true. That's you can true. ride the Sicilian donkeys right down to safety. Yeah, that's right. Could do that. Anyway, that's the, that's the news from uh, Longridge and that's the news from the <clears throat> census front. And uh, it all feels like, oh, one more comment. My supervisor said, look, they don't, they don't really care. Just, just do as much as you can do. Just, just do it. And if you can't, you know, that wow. they're beyond caring, I think. Yeah. It's so it's such a hassle. It's so it's so pressurized that uh, yeah. And a lot of people might be returning forms through the U.S. Postal Service, which is itself under under stress. So it's oh, like yeah. these things are just building on top of each other. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Our poor local post office is. Uh... Yes. <laughs> Yeah. It's still there. Um, Esty, you want to check in? Um, uh, quickly, I was just going to say, and we have Kamala. And that, <laughs> I want that to remain my key check-in for at least another hour or two. <laughs> we, spent a little, we, spent, we spent a little time at the start of the call, just like all cheering and jazz handsing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Excited. Yeah, yeah. So, so add me into that. Um, post hoc and for sure. um, I'll, I'm, I'm, I will join in video shortly, but I'll keep myself both muted and off video for the next bit. Thanks. Um, anything <laughs> else you want to, anything else you want to check in on besides, besides Kamala? Uh, no, because, um, uh, no, because I'm trying to stay in the positivity and ah, the, okay. yes, and the deep sense of, I will just add this, I remembered this morning as I woke up, the moment when it seems like a hundred years ago or five or something, driving down 101 to go to my spin class. And in the depths at uh, the beginning of the primary campaign and really being angry at Joe for joining the, you know, and like, do we have to you know, really? And then some, from somewhere deep down seeped up. And I think I was probably like 101 Menlo Parkish when it happened. And I was like, gee, could Joe Biden and Kamala Harris well, exactly. Your face really? says exactly what, and it sort of went up and down. I was like, where the hell did you come up with that from? And oh my goodness, I describe it as that moment of when the, when you swallowed the whiskey 
the first <laughs> gulp and it starts suffusing. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I'm in, uh, I'm wanting to appreciate the whiskey today. So Kamala is a shot of whiskey. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the piece, the, the Biden Kamala ticket, right? And that she is, and I'll, uh, you know, one more moment of joy is watching Rachel Maddow kind of present Kamala on her show last night. It was just like, okay, kill me now. Perhaps you have to, but I'm, I'm happy at this moment. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to maintain that into the morning. And no. with that, I, <clears throat> let, I give you guys permission to be the next part of my life. Depri deprive people of things for long enough and a small victory like this feels exactly, like a big, a big exactly. giant win. Exactly. Love exactly. That. Um, Mark, would you like to check in? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm checking in here from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I was just t telling Jerry earlier, uh, I guess this area is considered the safest COVID spot in North America. Um, like we've had zero new cases in, uh, I don't know, quite a few weeks. The few cases we have had in the last few months have all come in from outside, so we're all paranoid about outsiders. But there is this Atlantic or maritime bubble where people can, within the New Brunswick P PEI, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, you can travel freely. But even from other places in Canada, you have to shelter for two weeks. Anyway, so that's one thing, and it's kind of, I don't think we're particularly virtuous, uh, but it just, that's kind of the karma of what's been happening. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I was able to get beautiful cloth masks, $5 a piece from a local Japanese store. And, <laughs> and they actually feel good, uh, it, which is unusual. Um, otherwise, uh, actually, I guess maybe along with many other people, it's, in, in terms of climate change, climate collapse, uh, you know, I, I kind of realized that we're past the point of, hey, we can do something about this. Um, really, it's a matter of, uh, you know, how do we survive, uh, you know, upcoming catastrophe, uh, which is not helped by, uh, well, and maybe, uh, you know, looking to my neighbor down south, the U.S., it's, it, it's, it, considering how huge an impact the U.S. has, you know, that adds further kind of negative thoughts on that whole situation. But uh, for example, I, I read this, the New York Review of Books has this article, actually I'll paste that in, uh, by Bill McKibben uh, reviewing this book by Mark Linus on our final warning uh, about climate change. And uh, uh, it's pretty grim. And, you know, so, so what I started thinking about is, okay, how do we prepare uh, both sh for short-term shocks, long-term shocks? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's the, the whole Trump thing in the U.S. is like totally cataclysmic, but it's a minor cataclysm in some sense because there's this enormous monster right behind that. And so, yeah, you, uh, hopefully... Uh, uh, you know, January 20th, things will switch along onto different dimensions. Although, you know, again, I, I've got to admit that in terms of foreign policy, uh, the Dems and the GOP are not all that different. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of grim stuff, although hopefully we won't go this kind of insanity about, uh, you know, in amplifying stuff completely, you know, unnecessarily because things are tough enough as they are. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, th th those are, especially this thing about re realizing this thing about climate change that in, in, in this century, you know, we're going to have really significant collapse. We're going to have, you know, like there were 53 degree temperatures in the uh, Middle East, uh, you know, a few days ago, that's very close to the 54 degree wet bulb temperature. That's the highest human beings can take. Um, so, and I guess the other part of it is, is that there's this interesting word I've really come to like, uh, proprioception, which is the ability of an organism to both perceive and to respond 
in such a way so that A, it stays upright. So when we walk, we do all the right things. Uh, but in terms of societal proprioception, um, you know, I think it's really clear that our gov governance uh, is lacking that, our systems of governance. And uh, um, so, for example, I got Princeton study that showed that, yeah, when you actually look at what happens or what legislation gets passed in the U.S., it's, it's not a democracy in, in, in any quasi-literal sense of that, but an oligarchy or a plutocracy because you know what serves the interests of those in power is what actually get, tends to get passed. And, and there's a huge blind spot in that. Um, so how do you address that kind of inertia of blind spot um, on the one hand? But actually more, more interestingly maybe is, you know, our democracy is screwed up because like uh, through our media, through the internet, through all these devices that hopefully would have improved our access to information and to knowledge, to, to better knowledge that in fact, it's often working the opposite way. And which means it's undermining the possibility of democracy, undermining because we need to inform citizenry. So, so and maybe the final thing I mentioned is the kind of hopeful things I find is that there are these kind of almost like genius bodhisattvas that seem to be popping up. And one of them actually is someone you introduced to me uh, Jerry, which is Audrey Tang, and you know she's she's actually had a lot of work to do also with you know Taiwan's response to COVID and so on, and then more recently I've come across this guy Yosha Bach, J O S C H A. I'll put put the name in, and uh, uh, and you know interesting. He's an AI guy, a nerd, um, and but on the other hand, very extraordinary in terms of being very human. So for example, he says that the real model for, peop for people like him isn't really like Leibniz or Newton or Einstein, it's Goethe. You know, someone who, uh, Wolfgang Go Goethe, uh, you know, someone who, uh, you know, brings together all these kind of aspects of uh, human uh, sanity as well as, uh, you know, clear intellect and so on and, you know, scientific research investigation and so on. So in, again, this, this is coming back to the idea of proprioception that uh, we need to restore our ability to see what is really going on because so you can only live in a you know, reality TV universe for so long. And, and the problem with Trump is that he's always had the bankruptcy system to bail him out, but there's nothing to bail out. You know, when you're at the top, no one's gonna bail you out. And, and we're at the top of the kind of food chain in terms of the planet and no one's gonna bail us out either. Um, so it's, uh, there's no, uh, you know, there's no salvation gonna come from elsewhere. Uh, and going to Mars is, uh, I mean, that's its own adventure. Um, but that's not gonna bail us out either. I'd like to say, um, I've given a couple of speeches where I say, some people think we should just get off this rock. And then I add, I've read enough good science fiction to know you don't wanna be on the first thousand spaceships. Yeah. <clears throat> like that just ends badly it's it's you know and you have to make your own everything you know you and everything has to work flawlessly or you're all dead so anyway so i guess yeah. that's in terms of checking those the themes running through that's awesome and i need i so I, I added the link to joshua in my brain and he's a, like a a notable person for me but i hadn't been paying enough attention and i i love the meme on on goethe as a context for, for what to do. So I went and looked at Goethe in my brain while you were talking and I'm like, oh, interesting. And I've read zero, zero Goethe. Um, and I, I was reading a biography of Alexander von Humboldt, who is a crazy interesting fellow uh, as well back in the day. Like it's part of the reason why we have natural sciences at all um, was, was insanely interesting explorer and, and chronicler and scientist. Uh, but, but, but how to think about just, how to frame all these things really matters. Um. Jerry, can I jump in with a, a note to add to that amazing thing from Mark? Please do, and I think Mark was about to jump in too, so go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Estelle. okay, sorry, I can't see everyone. That's okay, um, go ahead. So go ahead. Proprioce proprioception is a thing that if you're a young dancer who's also scientifically um, endowed, shall we say, you learn early. And the main thing about proprioception is that it is inside the system. It is what you lose 
when, for instance, you pop your ACL while skiing and in the process of the surgery, you no longer somehow know, feel the connection between along the back of your leg, between the hip joint and where your leg is in space. And you can't use external cues, right? So there's nobody coming to save you because it has to go through the system and the nervous system, et cetera. So I love this pulling this forward, which seems to be happening now and applying it at the societal level. So thank you so much for that. My, one of my first obsessions, proprioception and knee mechanics, right? From age 17 <laughs> is, is providing insight thanks to you into today. <laughs> Thank you. Mark, did you want to add something? Okay. Uh, we don't hear you right now. You're muted, but uh, that's fine. Okay. Oh, there you go. You're now unmuted. You're good. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about, um, you know, the question is how we govern ourselves. And if we're introducing systems which kind of systematically undermine our ability to perceive what's really important. Um, I mean, that, that, that's like undermining of the possibility of democracy or of its being effective at least. And so, uh, so it's, a, it's a real interesting question. And, and partly it's, you know, it's like we give free reign to our technology just, I mean, e even though there's usually, you know, I mean, there's sort of caveats, like in terms of, you know, all kinds of biological technology, uh, gene editing technology, and of course, nuclear power is a long standing example as well. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's like our, our social media introduced these things on a huge scale, millions and billions of people. And then we see what happens. And it's, you know, if we ran vaccine trials that way, we'd have millions of people dead, basically, you know. Uh, so uh, th there's an interesting article I read about how um, the reason plants are green is kind of paradoxical because you would expect that, that in order to make photosynthesis really possible, there would be no green at all. But it turns out that in order to stabilize the process and make it kind of sustainable over time, over changes in light, happening, uh, it's much less efficient than it theoretically could be. But long term, th that's a better way for life to get along, essentially. It's more stable. And so that's kind of an interesting process because we always tend to aim for max efficiency. Let's yeah, extract yeah. everything and so on. Well, and, nature, uh, nature is wasteful, but, but in good redundant ways, usually. Um, that's fascinating. So, so between proprioception and the rest of this, uh, we may be losing and, and sort of there's a thought in my brain was 2006 peak, peak democracy. Um, mm -hmm. Because since then we've had the, the global shift, massive shift to the far right, authoritarian populism, illiberal democracy, all that kind of stuff is just getting huge. Um, and so we may be losing our control apparatus. Um, and as Esty added, the control apparatus often is sort of buried in the system. And if you sever those ligaments and nerves and, and sensory apparatus, then you lose the ability to actually control your downhill slide or to make it turn it into something else. And that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and you. first of all, to know where you are, you know, yeah. there mm -hmm. early notions of proprioception were about how you know where your body is in th and the pieces of it in 3D space. And how yeah. is it that you get your hand to the plate when you pick it up? And how is it, right, that you know where your arabesque is as you're twirling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it degrades, this is part of what, Mark, again, thank you, in little bits, right? But those blind spots render things discontinuous, right? Mm -hmm. um, the loss of the signal in a very small segment, right? And assuming that as nature goes, that keeps happening. 
um, so we don't literally don't know where we are, let alone, and once you know where you are, the system can can process that as direction, yeah. as setting direction. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, Orientation is really important. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. And it's the it's the afferent. It's the incoming signal proprioception. Mm -hmm. um, that and it, yeah. That that's critical. Um, let me let me do a check in. I've got a bunch of little things to, or each of which is sort of big, but I'm, I'll try to be brief. But I just typed into the chat a reminder to myself for the topics that we're building in my head. Um, the first is just this notion that there are these gigantic wicked problems that seem to be getting more wicked because we're ignoring them and fighting over or even addressing them. <clears throat> so right now we're in a lecture cycle. We're worried about Trump and the Trump apocalypse. We've got a pandemic going, which they're not responding to well none of which <clears throat> allows us to actually deal with climate change. You know, like, like climate change is off the table as a thing we can act on together right now. And, and God willing, it's actually a unifying factor if we can, you know, if we can achieve regime change in the US. Um, but even then, who knows, you know, who knows how this moves forward. So, so it's like, had we all been acting in unison and been able to figure out where we were, and I really, I like this theme of orientation and proprioception a lot, because um, we're losing we're losing the ability to know where we are and therefore which direction to head and therefore what to do next. And these things were all quite crucial to figuring out like how to deal unless we're, unless it's all everyone to themselves and we form little bubbles everywhere and each bubble figures out a, a local solution, like let's build a raft. And I was joking earlier in the chat, you know, every, every building from here forward should float because <clears throat> if sea level is going to rise, many, many, more than a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago after a conference, I, I jokingly bought the domain raftify.com and I put up a brief website, which is now gone. But, but the notion was uh, three quarters of the Earth's surface is already water. That's going to rise. We need to learn to live on the oceans. So let's go to, you know, uh, and I, I, I had a I had a Rex call, I think, early on about uh, ocean sailing protocol or whatever it was called, open ocean sailing, I think he called it. And it was at the same time as seasteading was coming up. And he said, no, 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 don't call it seasteading because seasteading is a bunch of libertarians who are trying to create uh, a libertarian ideal culture on a, on a cruise ship somewhere in the middle of the ocean. He was trying to invent a series of open hardware and software protocols so that we could all go build stuff that would function well, that would generate energy off of solar and wave, wave action and wind, that would, uh, you know, how to, how to make food, how to basically live, live on the ocean. So... That, and that's not even among the list of things I was thinking about. But I put China and climate change and all those like, I'm, I'm unclear what the hell to do about China because of the Uyghurs and Hong Kong, which we should mourn. Uh, and, 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 you know, so on the, on the one hand, I think China is way ahead of many people. I think that China is likely to come out of this whole mess of sort of collapsing incidents as the, the leading society on earth and it'll be a surveillance society. Um, and that's just you know, like tough, tough beans because that's the way it's going to play because the rest of us will be shooting ourselves in the foot well enough that we won't be in action. Um, and then uh, I'm a fan of the Kinevin framework, uh, Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework, and Anne Pendleton Julian. Do you guys all know Anne? Some of you do, some of you don't. So she's a really interesting thinker. She's been collaborating with uh, John Seeley Brown for the last five plus years, maybe, maybe 10 years. <clears throat> and then they have a series of books about design. And on the one hand, I love what they're doing, and Anne is not only familiar with, with Kinevin, but she's kind of um, gone through it and into, uh, she has a critique of Kinevin and, and sort of more useful framings, but then the work is kind of impenetrable. So uh, I've got two books right here at hand. Um, <clears throat> one book I got, which is called Pragmatic Imagination. It's the sort of the introduction to their Design Unbound series. I think this is backwards because I'm mirroring my display. Does this show up as, as correct for you guys or is this backwards? Oh, so you see it right. That's a, it's, it's mirroring just for, for me. Oh, that's right. It's locally mirrored because we like to see ourselves the way we look in the mirror because otherwise we think we're looking weird for everybody else. So interesting, the human mind. And then recently I got this book of uh, theirs uh, because I was trying to learn about systems of action, which is a part of the framework that they're trying to build. And this was, I had to get this from Lulu Press because that's how they've published it and it took two weeks to get here and it, I, it gets here and then I read the opening paragraph. And the opening paragraph is basically, 
Uh, this is the change triangle, a meta tool for change that is about designing an ecology of conditions for change that works on changing an organization or a system itself, which I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Booklet 14, Systems of Action, is our other meta tool for change. I'm like, shit, that's the thing I'm trying to learn about. Why did I get this book and why did I wait two weeks for the book? And why is all this information locked away in, in like book form, right? Uh, like I'm, I'm pissed because, because this is inaccessible. And, and also Anne's writing is more academic than my normal filters are set. So I have a hard time reading kind of the, the stuff that they're writing. In fact, I had to stop reading this book because I got, I got some ways into it and I'm like, I think I'm clearly in their audience and I am just having to read things five times over again. And I had the good fortune in, in grad school um, to study under Russell Acoff, who was a, an early systems thinker. And Acoff had this insane skill of writing about very sophisticated things in a 10th grade level so that you would read it and you'd be like, why did nobody tell me about this before? And you could read it and absorb it and remember it immediately. And I'm finding the, the, the going really thick which brings me to Open Global Mind, which is like my passion project at this point and the thing that I'm really excited about. And part of what I want to do with OGM is make ideas like sort of liberate them, amplify them and turbocharge them. Because I, I know that there's a whole bunch of ponies in here. I just don't have the effort and it's locked away inside of a you know, softbound, softbound book from Lulu Press. Um, how, how do we connect this to action and make it so that groups like the group that Dave was talking about uh, earlier uh, can, you know, and all the ideas that they're creating actually are amplified and, and available to people because we need to get together and figure out where are we, like to orient ourselves, figure out where are we, where do we think we're aiming, and we don't need a consensus on this. We need a, what, what Quakers call sense of the meeting. We, we need a, a sense of unison and a sense of community we don't need 100% of the vote to agree that like that's north and we're all going to do exactly this. I think that's, that's wrong. But we need to collectively act in, in, in a general direction so that we're actually amplifying one another's efforts, pulling everybody along, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of messy. Um, so that was the thinking about Kinevin and frameworks and, and it ties really well to this idea of, of where we are. And then a, a small thing, a uh, couple nights ago, uh, April uh, was off on a writing retreat. She, she booked a local Airbnb to go write for a couple of days. And I and a couple friends from San Francisco were in town. They've left San Francisco, but they were in town. So I had actual dinner with friends at a restaurant, which I hadn't done in so long that as I walked up toward the restaurant, I was having all these weird feelings in me like, wait, wait, what, what? And, and it was just this weird, I was like battling myself to go sit with them outside at a restaurant and have dinner. And then the first thing they say when, when I sit down is like, they cheerfully say, oh yeah, yeah, we had COVID, we're over it now. And I'm like, what? And wouldn't it have been nice if, had they told me that before I showed up? Because then I could process it on my own. Like, because nobody knows the long tail of COVID. And you might test positive, but we don't really know how this thing hides. I was impressed many years ago when I came back from one of my few trips to India and I thought I had malaria and I was lucky enough to talk to a woman who was a, a, an expert in tropical diseases. And she said, well, turns out there's five kinds of malaria. We have no test that will tell you that malaria is in your system. The only way we have to catch it is if you have an incident and it flares up and we take a swab and look, there's one of the, there's one of the five organisms of malaria. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. So it hides in your system your whole life. And you, there's, we have no scientific way of identifying that you're carrying malaria. And she's like, mm -hmm. yep. And I don't know if the science on that has changed, but my mind was blown by that because our biologies are actually really intricate and complicated. And so here are these two guys, these, these friends who are, who are like cheerfully, well, we're over it, we're done. We tested positive, we're, we're, we're good. And my insides are again going, rah, rah, rah. we turned out to have a, a lovely dinner and a, and a great time, but, but, I, all these, like, and that's very light sort of compared to the collective trauma that people are going through compared to, and I'm going to go back to what Bo started with, sort of the economics of this, compared to the fact that benefits are ending right now. Congress in, is in lockdown. The president proposed something that has the lockdown worse. Um, and there's going to be this upstream cascade, uh, I, I think, I th you know, when when people who hold leases don't pay their leases and the landlords can't pay their banks and the banks can't 
participate in the system and nobody's paying taxes because nobody's making money and the tax system falls apart, all of this collapses in, in really in, in much larger ways than we've witnessed so far. So, I, so and, and I envy whoever wins the next election because winning is gonna be like very bittersweet because you know, if we think Obama inherited a bag of shit in you know, 2008, uh, 2009, uh, this is this is like 10, 100 times worse than that with the climate apocalypse just over the horizon uh, that nobody's acting on, right? Um, and so there's just there's just so much to do and we're not and we're actively undermining our ability to come to a consensus of a rough consensus of where we are and what to do together. Um, and so that's part of the mission of Open Global Mind is to figure out how do we make better collective decisions. And part of the part of my inspiration, which I don't think I've articulated this way before, is how do we tackle these kinds of problems together, and in particular over that damned cultural divide. Right? How do how do we bridge that cultural divide to 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 manage to do something together with people who are our our others? with a capital O. We're busy otherizing a whole lot of folks. And uh, here, one, you know, one of my heroes is Daryl Davis. I might have mentioned him on previous Rex calls. Uh, Daryl is a black jazz pianist who years ago was playing piano in a bar and a white guy walks up to him and says, hey, I never heard a black guy play Jerry Lee Lewis quite that well. And Daryl says, well, it's a big surprise. I, I taught Jerry Lee Lewis how to play some piano. And they became friends. And it turns out this guy was a Klan member. And so now, maybe three decades later, um, Daryl Davis has a garage full of KKK robes because he very patiently sat down and attended KKK rallies and sat, had dinner with KKK members, was invited into their homes, and they started retiring out, including a couple of grand wizards. Um, and it's a story of patience and vulnerability and trust and all that kind of stuff. And there's a nice documentary about Daryl where at, toward the end of the documentary, two young black activists are in the documentary, they're being interviewed, and they are mad as hell at Daryl. They're just pissed at him because they think he's wasting his time. They're like, just even talking to these people is a waste of time. And I'm like, no, he's not. Because if we can melt, if we can melt the grudges, if we can hear them and we can deal with them, we won't have half the population against the other half and everybody like tilting at windmills because otherwise I think we're locked in, locked in a mortal struggle. We're busy fighting over the joystick while the plane flies you know, into a cliff. And that's, that's kind of a metaphor for where we are right this second. And, and, and over all of civilization, I think we've been fighting over the joystick. Uh, there's a thought in my brain that we've, we're in a titanic battle of the scripts in our heads and we've had a couple of Rex calls about the scripts in our heads. And then at the end of that thought in my brain, it says, and we always have been, because this is what religions do. This is what grand societies do. And, and every, eh, every 100 years, every 300 years, we get a whole new set of scripts implanted and the old way of being together is wiped out. We're like, we don't remember what life was like before. This is one of the reasons I love Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation is that he's describing how we lived before the Industrial Revolution and then the early effects of industrialization. That's what he's describing. And for me, it's a refresher course on how we lived before everything had a price, before um, you know, money, land, and labor, three, three new fictitious commodities, took over our brains. Like if you don't have money, you can't stay alive. Guess what? That wasn't true before 1700. Simply wasn't true, right? Um, we lived in, in very different ways that we can no longer conceive of. So now our, our debate is, is it, is it free market capitalism or socialism slash communism, which look how broken that was, you know, uh, look at Mao and, and Stalin, look how horrible that system was. And it's like, this is a false dichotomy, but it's the argument we're having over and over again, and we can't get past it. And so we're disoriented completely. And, and <clears throat> I'll refer again to Hypernormalization, the documentary by Adam Curtis, where he says we are already in a nonlinear war. And that in this nonlinear war, intentional disorientation is the perfect tool to get what you want. And so if we're surrounded by danger and we're told to fear one another and to fear the danger, we are very easy to manipulate. And Jamais is, is reporting in that if we can cut population back down under a billion, we'll probably be okay. Which, which I, you know, that could happen. All the that possible. Next ten years of war is really high, and uh, 
economic well, war start, and then after the economic war, the real war happens. And, then and in the meantime, the natural war happens. And, and I, th I think I've mentioned in Rex calls before that the, the one of the natural catastrophes that really scares me, because sea levels rise, people will move around, there will be my, you know, refugees, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but we'll kind of adapt and deal and wealthy people will go find themselves a better place. The, the, the one that I'm really worried about is the oceans. And the oceans are under like 10 different, in, you know, simultaneous crises. And if we kill off life in the oceans, we've basically killed off life on Earth. And that, that's the one that seems to me like an extinction level event. That all the others, rich people will avoid as best they can. People with pitchforks will come try to take what they have, et cetera. It'll be messy, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause like civilizational collapse. That's the one that really scares me the most. Um, and I just saw something about caste um, uh, yesterday in the flow. So um, SC, if you want to tell us a, a little bit about that. And then Jamie, I'd love for you to check in. You, you missed every, we've been all over the place already. So uh, SD, do you want to say a little bit about caste? Uh, I'm about uh, halfway through the book. And um, I think it is when you mentioned Polanyi, mm -hmm. right? I realized that in some ways this book is the next one for me mm. in that sequence. So fundamentally uh, addressing. Um, and, you know, one of the points she makes about slavery is that it's eight generations, 10, genera 10 generations, race is entirely socially constructed. Anyway, I just offer it to us as a, and the writing is beautiful. It is both succinct and lyrical and she uh, brings personal in stories and reference into it just perf beautifully. I think it's also the next form of writing in some ways. Really? The, the yin and yang, um, uh, change your change your worldview, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she talks about three castes. The three modern examples of caste are slavery in this country. Um, the Nazis and India. Whoa. So, yeah, that's enough to say. Back wow. to our back to our program. Back to our program, which is already in progress, and I just purchased the Kindle version. <clears throat> Good have I have solution. already outlined far more than Kindle will ever ever let me export to a Word doc. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't stop underlining just the writing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, re I'm reading Sand Talk and I'm reading it on Kindle, but I'm highlighting. And uh, my problem with Sand Talk was I, I was running out of room to highlight because you know, when you highlight adjacent sentences, you can't tell that there's yes. two, two different clusters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unless you take the time to highlight in a different, you know, pastel highlighter color, which I wasn't doing. Which anyway. I'm doing on my Kindle that doesn't have color. Gotcha. Damn it. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> Bo, have you read the book or are you pasting from a review? Pasting from a, of a review. Cool, thanks. Has anybody read the book? Yet? Okay, let's, let's, um, let's a couple of us dive in and Essie, as you read further, if you want to like book report style share back more, that would be really fantastic. <clears throat> and then uh, Dave, what's the solar punk link? Well, I've been trying, actually was having a little bit of an interaction around this this morning around positivity and negativity. I feel like one of the like themes of regeneration ought to be that we're opportunity oriented, not problem oriented. Yeah. Problems kind of, you know, you're trying to get to whatever peak you're on, but you might not be on the right peak. And opportunity kind of just allows us to kind of do, a, I think, a positive, you know, uh, exciting, motivating kind of transition. So I, I kind of react now to like wicked problems and all these kinds of framings, which seem to me to be pushing us back into a, the old framework. Um, but then how do you explore that? And so, you know, Bobby Fishkin was pointing out that there, people are developing this new genre of, of science fiction. So solar punk or hope punk or eco punk, or, hmm. you know, there's, there's people trying to tell a story of what the future could be that's not dystopic, you know, that, that <laughs> has positive outcomes, and, you know, inevitably has lots of solar, solar energy and, and blimps moving everybody around and things like that. But what's but, not to like about a blimp? You know, I, I, I want my own now. So yeah, dirigib dirigibles are canonically a sign that you're living in an alternate universe. 
yes like i see i see a lot of blimps around this must be some other some other world or some alternate future um uh, uh, let me let me riff for a second and then pass it to you Jamais. <laughs> um partly because i went through this phase a while ago and and when i heard about appreciative inquiry from david cooper writer and i'm like I need to learn more. And I looked around and Cooper Ryder has not written very much that's articulated about it. <clears throat> and then I said, surely there's a, a small book about appreciative inquiry. So sure enough, there's a book called The Little Book of Appreciative Inquiry, uh, amazingly enough. So I, I bought that, got it, read it, and it said almost nothing. And, and so I, I was kind of stuck because this idea of let's look, let's look together toward a positive outcome is a brilliant idea. And it, and it runs completely counter to my general attitude that unless you understand something about how the sausage got made, <clears throat> you're going to end up with the same sausage in the same situation. You're going to guide your way back into the same familiar rut because you need to understand what was broken about the system, how the system broke. And I think Cass is trying to uncover what we did was we invented a social contract con, uh, construct that these people are worse than, than us and therefore it's okay for us to kill them off right? Or enslave them or whatever. And I just finished reading a docu uh, watching a, a documentary uh, called King Leopold's Ghost, which is based on the book about King Leopold II of Belgium. I had read the book before. The documentary was like a fresh new look because it had, it had film and a whole bunch of new things, including a scroll through what happened to the Congo since then with Lumumba and, and everybody else. And it was like a big wake up call again about how shitty humans can be to other, other humans. Um, all of this kind of provoked by the uh, global reaction to the to the taking down of Confederate monuments in the U.S., which has turned into, hey, King Leopold of Belgium, not the coolest dude, um, etc. So anyway, I'm trying to figure out how much bad news to deliver in order to get people together to design a better system. Because <clears throat> I I think I agree with what Dave just said a lot, which is, if we have these solar punk or positive visions of the world, we can get together and do stuff. My fear is that we won't do stuff that falls far enough away from where we are to actually rethink these things. And in order to do that, we need to understand a bit of how things got here and to have some orienting principles around how to steer and how to guide, which is partly what Rex was, has been, and partly what Design from Trust is meant to be. So, so my notion for Design from Trust is, hey, all our institutions are broken partly because we lost faith in humans, if we start redesigning these systems from an assumption that most people have good intent, look, we get better, cheaper outcomes, it renits society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not so great for monopolists. And that's too bad. Sorry about that. Um, and, and, you know, play that out. But I, it, was a, it was a junior varsity attempt to give us a simple guideline, trust, Assume, assume good intent was like the, the, the foundational part to get us toward acting together in a way that might get us away from the current institutions, which assume that we're all acting in bad faith, which is where digital, which is where technology is, is going anyway. We're going to have a surveillance society and we're going to have algorithms that try to make all the decisions for us. We're going to move away from humans actually coming back into community and learning to trust each other if the technocrats have their way and the techno, even the techno utopians have their way. So, so with that light introduction, Jamei, do you want to do a check-in? <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry that I end up late. I unfortunately now have a, a, uh, a weekly 8.30 call that is scheduled for a half hour, usually runs an hour and 15. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but that weekly call, IFTF related, but it's just yet another example of how much work I'm finding myself doing. I'm actually very busy these days, which is runs contrary to most of the rest of the world, unfortunately. Um, but so much of it is around um, building Potemkin futures. Basically, you know, working with organizations as they try to think through their futures that are not shiny and happy. You know, they're challenging and um, you know, provocative, but completely miss the point. I mean, nobody wants wants to hear about the things that they don't have an easy or even a difficult answer for. Like the pandemic um, and the super for and the and the super game that that you guys created for IFTF. Right. Exactly. Right. Back in two thousand nine. Right. Um, and so it's 
Well, I don't know if, you, if any of you saw what my, my post on Twitter yesterday. So the reason I keep my hair cut short is to keep me from ripping it all out in frustration. You know, when I when I do this work is, um, you know, and so you know, at the same time, I can pay my mortgage and that's a good thing. And so I'm not going to, you know, hold on to the principle that this, none of this is actually good for the planet. So I'm going to say no. No, I'm going to say yes, take the money and, you know, cross my fingers. Be, be glad that I am on the, the downhill part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh let's see just working uh just as a, as a follow-up some of you might recall that uh my wife had endometrial cancer she had her surgery she's in recovery recovery has gone well she's actually back back to work um working from home but back to work and um so that's very much a relief um that's wonderful thank you yeah Ooh, got her. I mean, the, this that moment of her coming in to, to where I was sitting and saying, you know, basically, I need to have cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. It's just so surreal. Yeah, and, you know, and she was really lucky that it was caught very early and didn't spread at all, and you know, required no chemo or anything like that. So it's like wow. basically the best case for a worst case situation. Um, but damn, that was, that was stressful. Yeah. Um, some of you might recall the whole Banny stuff that, uh, we had a, we played around with for a while. Well, it continues to spread like the, like, like the creeping cognitive mold that it is. And, um, I'm now seeing uh, people talking about it in Brazil and Germany. And this guy in Germany actually came up with a really great infographic comparing uh, Benny and VUCA, and I'll send it to Jerry's list so that you can distribute it. But it's actually a really interesting illustration uh, and a nice summary of it. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's always heartening to see I, you know, potentially useful ideas spread. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to, um, I'm, as I told somebody, I'm a professional doom scroller. And, um, you know, there's only so much I can get away from. Is that on your LinkedIn profile? World. It's actually on my Facebook page now. Awesome. As my, as my bio, professional doom scroller. Awesome. That's great. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I can't get away from it. Can I ask you a question? But, Yes, please. If we were to like hit the neuralizer and you know vanish the current situation in which you just described very nicely, which is I'm I'm doing this because this and, and this and this and I can pay the mortgage and so forth. But if but if you had if you had not if you didn't have to worry about funds and funding and could just sort of blank the screen and devote your life energy to some activity, what would that be? Um Horribly, it would be pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, in um, what ways might I have, it be different? I, I have been fascinated for decades by the interplay of history and innovation and fear and, <laughs> and um, creativity that lead to building different futures. I mean, I, I wrote about future stuff in college in the, in the 80s, in grad school in the 90s. This is, I've been doing you know, professional future stuff for 25 years. This is really um, fascinating and compelling and seductive and terrifying, and I can't look away. And so if you cleared out everything based on who I have, become over the years, I would very quickly gravitate back towards trying to understand the world and where it's going. By inventing narratives that illustrate where the, where the forces you're detecting are likely to take us sort of thing so that people can engage? 
that is ha that has turned out to be a, a useful way of um, uh, um, weaponizing uh, the work, <laughs> uh, yeah. basically you know, ma making you know, reifying the, uh, the the work, you know, the the observations, yeah. and to make them into something that other people can use. It turns out I have a you know a mi moderate skill for writing, and that turns out you know. What? No, I'm. I know a lot of people who write a lot better than I do, uh, but I'm. Uh, but it turns out that that's a useful a useful combination. Have you ever wished had, that somebody if I had a was? Face, I would go. I do YouTube videos. Have you ever wished that someone was taking these and dramatizing them into movies or into other works? I have had the uh, enormous. Uh, gift of having seen some of these, some of the stuff I've written dramatized. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it's unsettling. Because, uh, and not in a bad way necessarily, but I have constructed worlds in my head and to see them become um, 3D instantiations with actual people. It, and that's, um, you know, it's, it's unsettling in that sense of it's like, you know, a tremor under your feet. But, um, I am trying to understand how, you know, there's a part of me that's trying to, to connect what I'm seeing and my hearing my words come from somebody's mouth um, with the logic and um, world building that I've been doing in my, that I've done in my head. Mm -hmm. I wrote something years ago um, about the fact that being playing Dungeons and Dragons in high school and college, um, and primarily being the dungeon master for people for the gaming, that has been a really critical part of uh, how I've constructed my my present day life. Um, basically, it has been you know it was my task to build the world, you know, within which other people tell their stories. And that in many ways, that's what scenario, scenario writing is. You're building multiple worlds you know, within which other people create their own visions of the future. You know, and sometimes that involves telling narrative. Sometimes that involves essentially uh, you know, uh, creating a, a, a verbal spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, this has been something that's been, in, that's been in, in, intrinsic, almost in, um, almost genetic for me um i'm, I'm really curious about the, genetically i'm sorry the doom scroller part of it does uh, that is the doom part inevitable i guess i was trying to figure out how to like frame it i mean it's appealing right i mean i feel like in certainly like if you watch nonprofit advertising it's all catastrophe oriented because that's what raises the money you don't have a lot mm -hmm. of nonprofits telling a happy story because people don't fund the happy stories they fund the doom stories but I mean, like one of my, is like, if you were doing the same profession 150 years ago and you had predicted doom, would it look like what we're in? Um, or would you have predicted, I mean, is this doom or would you have predicted this? Or, I mean, how do you, how do you test the counterfactual, I guess, is kind of the question, but. Well, the, the goal of this isn't to be, isn't to predict. Predict for people who do futures work, you know, predict is a dirty word. I mean, it, it is to, um, illustrate possible consequences and to, you know, the, the, the cliche that I use in my talks is, um, you know, to trigger epiphanies, you know, to, to allow people to see the possible consequences of their present day choices in new ways. Uh, Aren't and, there positive possible consequences? And do you ever tell yes. them? I mean, how do you become for, a doom scroller? And, Why aren't you a, an optimism, an optimism so, scroller? Do you ever hear of the, of the website World Changing? started in 2003. Um, it was uh, Alex Stefan and I founded it in 2003 as an expressly optimistic site for looking at, you know, we know the world, there are a lot of problems, let's look at the solutions. Let's focus on the, not just, ha not happy stories, but here are the tools and ideas and models and beliefs that, that push us forward and don't just keep, keep us mired in catastrophe. And um, 
so I, I don't know if you saw on the uh, the group chat uh, early on. I said something like, uh, "I was an optimist for a while. I hated it." Well, no, I wish I actually I was the primary writer for that site for several years. You're a card carrying so, optimist. A card carrying optimist, and um, seeing so much of what I could, spending so much time looking at what we could do, and not seeing it materialize looking at all of the ways that we could solve our problems and seeing people flat out refuse to take that path. Seeing our, our intrinsic, intrinsic human ability to create turned into um, shit. And something that's been, this is not a new thing, you know, circa 2010. It is something that is, has been part of the human experience, but in particular, as the problems that we are facing have become so um, colossal, as the complexity of the challenges have become so um, spaghettified, um, yeah, it, it, the, the, the source code for the world is spaghetti code. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's made me the worst kind of optimist. It, the, the kind of, it, I'm the disappointed optimist. I'm the frustrated, cynical optimist because I know we could, we could do this, we can do this right. I know exactly how we can do this and do this right. And we fucking refuse to do it. Um, and so for me, doom scrolling just happens to be the, the particular cliche of the moment. Um, I, I, you know, I, I like it as a, as, as a term, but it's, it's a fairly recent thing and it'll evaporate in time. You know, the reality is that I'm not so much doom scrolling as I'm world scrolling. I'm, you know, trying to see the pieces as they emerge and, you know, catch the hints, the distant early warnings. You know, the, I try to be the do line. Um, you're the doom line. Your 1950s so Cold War technology. You're the, you're the doom line. We can invent a new acronym. <laughs> the do line of the doom line. Yeah, exactly. Um, a different question. Um, yes. Over time, you've written a lot. Um, when you write all these stories for IFTF, do they own the, I the IP or do you? So I repeat. Do they own the IP on the stories or do you? Uh, it depends on the project. Um, when I do stuff expressly for a commercial client, it's theirs. It's work for hire. The, it's work for hire. But in, in the, the particular um, construction of a set of ideas, the ideas are, remain mine and I, ideas will get used elsewhere. Um, I'm asking the, partly, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I'm asking partly because uh, just to propose an experiment for you if you'd like, because, because this is kind of your legacy. These are the things you've created. And, and I, I think your hand is blocking your microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, that better? Okay, good. Um, so, so these pieces you've written are kind of your legacy. This is, you know, the, the, your writing is your legacy. So I'm asking about whether you have the freedom to do with it. That's, what, that's why the IP question. But then I'm like thinking, well, one thing you could do, and you could just try this with a story or two, is put them on Gitbook or hit record uh, or hit record. I don't even know if hit record is still around, but it was really kind of a cool site um, started by the actor whose name escapes me now. Um, and it was basically places where other people can riff on the plot and sort of uh, if it's Gitbook, then they can do fork and pull and you can elaborate the stories and basically build a, a community story from, from like you could seed something and then see where it goes and just experimenting with maybe doom literature or doom visualizations or, or something like that. And then also, and, and Gitbook would be just books and writing um, hit record would be, uh, other media, so people would, you know, be creating videos, animations, what, what, what have you, mm. and maybe much more. I don't know, but I'm, I'm trying to imagine if you took some pieces of of your work, of your legacy, and 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 stimulated imagination and production in different ways, it might ripple out much more than it has so far. That's worth pursuing. I'll take a look at that. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, one other point I want to make, though, is that. You know, I may joke about doom scrolling and they call myself a professional eschatologist, you know, whatever is the uh, amusing phrase of the moment for me. Um, but that's not entirely true. When I, when I construct 
scenarios of challenging, complex, sometimes horrifying futures, they're never straightforward disaster movies. You know, my goal when I try to when I try to construct these scenarios is to understand how could people live in this world. What are the moments of of uh, joy that they could find in this world? Where do where are people happy in this world as much as you know these may be worlds where it's hard to find happiness? You know, where are the ways in which this, these worlds are? Um, in what ways are these worlds banal? In what ways are these world, do these worlds feel normal for the people who are living, living in them? I mean, it, it, good scenarios, you know, from my perspective, a good scenario should let you feel, let you experience what it's like to live in this as the normal world. And it may be challenging, mm. it may be confusing, but for you in that moment, for you in this world, in this future, of course that's the way it is, that's the world. Which brings me back to an idea I had back when we were both at the Idea Factory, basically trying to elaborate on GBN multiple scenario forecasts with the novellas. And I was like, okay, so even if, if Idea Factory and we do our job perfectly, a subset of the company shows up and has a three-day experience, which is transformative. They go back into the normal environment. The half-life of these ideas is like that. And basically it all dies. How about if, as one thing we did, we created four mailing lists, you know, I, I do, thanks Esty. Um, how about if we created four mailing lists, one for each scenario, and we populated each mailing list with a couple of actors, like we used to hire the Flying Valencias, but, but these would be really, really good sort of uh, thread hosts, whose job it was to provoke and enforce the scenario logic of each of the different scenarios, so that the client and others, whoever, could inhabit these worlds over time and elaborate the fantasies and draw them out in different ways. And I, I think I only mentioned this once and never got picked up, but, but, but partly I think change happens through repeated exposure. We need to dip into the stream often. And this would be a very low cost thing to do. Uh, might be an interesting experiment. Anyway, I thought I'd dig it out of old memory and put it back on the table. No, oh, it is interesting. I think the, the main... And that was in the same yes, planning but. thing with, with four narratives, but go ahead. Yeah, the, the yes but aspect is because um, you know I can never do a yes and um, <laughs> uh, it's time. Do pe will people have time to spend living in these alternate worlds? I think um, you know that. I think you know that they will. It just may not be the subset of people you'd like to be in that world. But there, there's plenty of people who, if they find something tasty, will spend an inordinate amount of time on it. But, but you're looking for like the leaders or the designers or the whatevers of the world to spend their, the, the appropriate time in marinating in the scenarios. Because um, there's no the doubt that on earth will do this. In Pardon? the context of scenarios being a professional, uh, professional product, then yeah, yeah I, the idea would be to get the people who have the opportunity, who have the ability to make decisions that can influence the direction that we go, either for the organization or for the planet. That would be wonderful. Um, in terms of just simply getting getting people writ large to um, start to think about think about different possible futures rather than just feeling narrowly driven into a single inevitable outcome, that I love it. That's kind of what we did back in two thousand nine with Superstruct. Um, you know, the th idea of having except there was just one scenario. But but here you might have the opportunity to play out multiple right. multiple worlds. Right. Um, I don't know how I don't know how effective that would be. I don't know how people would respond to that. It's certainly um, I certainly wouldn't dismiss it. Anybody have I thoughts on this? Want to riff on this? Yeah, I feel like I'm ho totally suddenly monopolizing everything, and I'm very sorry since we're at time too. I think this is what the our Rex check-ins do: is like something tasty shows up in the call, and we just pursue it for a while. And so don't don't feel guilty. I think this was for me; it was fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody else wants to chip in or has has riffs on this. But please, this is this is our mo. Okay. Yeah, the, the thing that comes to mind is uh, for some reason I thought of rock and roll. <laughs> and, and the thing about rock and roll is that not that there was this, you know, one super group, which like dominant, I mean, there were super groups, obviously, but there were garage bands everywhere. And so it was something which stimulated a lot of people to do it 
you know, it's kind of a meme, I suppose. And, but, but you get a lot of people who get hooked and then they do it. And so it kind of replicates. And uh, I don't know, maybe there's something to that as a model. There are certainly far fewer groupies in the scenario world. <laughs> Damn it. Um, and I recently heard the story told of how the Beatles got famous, which was one of these like small coincidences kind of stories, which was riveting. It was like, oh my God, that's so completely cool. Um, other thoughts? I know Bo has something to add. Oh, I did. <clears throat> I, I, I just keep thinking about how this, the, co the, the virus thing and, and we're living in a world of store time. It's really exciting. It's, it, it's like a car crash. I'm, I'm excited and enthralled. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you know, 100 years from now, people are going to be, what was it like to live then? And I'm in it now. And uh, so I, I have the car crash thing that I'm living through. Um, but also, it seems to me there's this liminal state we're in. This is very liminal since we're having to suspend normal reality. It really is a, a very powerful time in, in, in history. We're, we're sitting on the sidelines. And uh, there could be some really positive outcomes to this because we're having to like, this is, I mean, what's so different about this from the depression was in the depression, they blamed people. Oh, they got what they deserved. You can't blame anyone for this virus. Well, you can, of course, the Chinese, blah, blah, blah. But uh, so what about that, Jamey group? What do you guys think about that? I, I, I just think there's some, it's, this is a very powerful and creative time in some respects too. Yeah. Um, uh, this isn't this. This is a response that uh, may may sound offhand. I keep thinking about what would have happened if Hillary Clinton had won in in 2016. Um, we, we undoubtedly would would not have gone through a lot of the crap that we've been going through. She would probably have handled the virus much better if she was still in office. Because remember, if she won, she would still have to deal with an entirely Republican uh, Congress that would have as their task of day one getting rid of her. She would have gone through several impeachments, or at least impeachment indictments, possibly one one or two impeachment hearings, whether it was because of Benghazi or something made up or some random event. Um, the All of the, the crap that happened with Russia would have been um, uh, put, put pushed away as being, oh, you, she's just being a sore winner, you know, trying to investigate that stuff. Trump would have a completely un, uh, unchecked voice, and he has an unchecked voice now to the extent that he can say whatever he wants, but there are, there are literally millions of people who push back on him, push back at him. And that wouldn't be the case if he had lost and then became the head of Trump and then. Um, and so I think in many respects, the potential that we have for a better future in the next decade is because Trump won, not in spite of Trump winning. Because we wouldn't, I don't think we would have had AOC. I don't think we'd have had, you know, the, the squad. We wouldn't have had the 2018 Democrat, the, the kinds of Democrats who won in 2018 winning. I think we would have, we, it would have been a dismal four years that just would have felt stagnant. It may not have felt disastrous. It may not have felt like we were on the edge of catastrophe, but it would have felt stagnant. And frankly, and Clinton would have been blamed from high heavens for the for coronavirus uh, had, had she been in office. And the Republicans um, would have stopped money coming out of the federal government. These $600 checks, that, that wouldn't have happened. Right. You think of all the things that, that we have met, been pushing for that would not have gotten a hearing had we been still living in the, essentially the legacy of the 1990s. Um, and, uh, and, and so <laughs> it's exciting. It is that it is a kind of a car crash or maybe it, it is teetering on the edge of a cliff. We have the, we have the possibility here of things going to just utter shit in hell. And say, there are certainly many reasons to believe that, that they will, but we also have pieces showing up forces in play that could push back really hard, push back harder than we ever ever could have hoped even 10 years ago. Um, yeah. What if Black Lives Matter, would that, would that kind of cultural 
tsunami that's hitting us? Would that have happened if Hillary Clinton was president? Um, probably not. It really depends. <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons that Black Lives Matter, this, this latest iteration of it has become so powerful is because of the um, uh, yeah, being velocity, yeah. the, I'm sorry? Uh, the, you're, you're muted. Trump is, the federal troops being sent and Trump has helped accelerate and, and, and empower and quicken things. Well, it's also the, the, the velocity and the ferocity of the coronavirus. Because so many people were not have not been in working or were working from home, suddenly you had a mass of people who were available to that's protest. In mm -hmm. Portland, in Portland, that's what people are doing instead of working. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, oh, and, and that's not. And I don't mean that as kind of snide humor. I mean that seriously. You have people who, in in the past, may have wanted to protest, had sympathies, but you know they had to deal with their jobs, had to deal with taking the kids to school, whatever. And now they have time and space, and they have a they have an outlet for the frustration and anger they feel about what's happening, and and getting that direct pushback so they could have so, something and someone to really focus their anger at. And it's, um, I you know again, it's I don't want to make it sound like everything is wonderful because of the disaster we're going through, but I think that the disaster has become an enabler for. Mm -hmm. um, positive drivers that wouldn't have been there before. Is, is that optimistic enough for you, David? <laughs> Love that. Yeah, um, I definitely had that same problem with kind of like, it's like, yeah, it would, it, it's going to be fundamentally different because of this stuff. And it's like, you know, for better or worse, we're going to look back and say, yeah, Trump made the world better. Uh, I think. It, it makes me think of that. What's that joke about, you know, well, I can't, I, like, let, well, let's see, you know, the, you know, the, the guy who's kid breaks his leg and everybody says, oh, that's too bad. He says, we'll see. Then the kid doesn't have to go to war. And the guy right. says, that's great. Says, we'll see. So it's definitely <laughs> that scenario. Exactly. Uh, we have gone well over our, our normal 90 minutes. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody being here and, uh, and uh, what we do. So um, I appreciate you giving us this space, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you all very, very much. Great to see everybody. See you on the inner tubes. <laughs>